Greetings. My name is Matt Meyer, and I'm the co-secretary general of the International Peace Research Association. And pleased to welcome you to this presentation on some of IPRA's youth leadership and training work, especially as it relates to international work around the United Nations and here in New York. Uh, though we're going to try to quickly jump into some inspiring stories uh, about and from youth leaders, including some examples of work that uh, some of our youth leadership scholarship recipients have done in the last few years. Uh, I wanna first say a few words about our history. Uh, IPRA has long since its founding decades ago, had a close relationship with the United Nations. Uh, one of our founders, Dr. Elise Boulding, was a distinguished uh, consultant and fellow to UNESCO, and IPRA continues to enjoy consultative status with ECOSOC. And in that context and through that history, we've been involved in many twists and turns in the strange labyrinth of non-governmental work within the United Nations, always wanting to make a difference, but never wanting to become too subsumed, too ghettoized by that UN NGO, um, almost self-centered, self-referential space. And we've had an extraordinary group and we continue to have an extraordinary group of people helping us do that. I will just mention a few names, uh, one of past and the rest of present IPRA UN team members uh, to speak to some of that history. Um, the first I wanna say is a woman named Anita Venden. Uh, Anita passed uh, this last year uh, and Anita was one of the key prominent US-based peace educators uh, who not only supported K through 12 education for peace, but also was the book review editor for many years of the Journal of Peace Education. Uh, long before I became Secretary General or even a member of IPRA Council, I worked uh, with and under Anita Wenden uh, and her husband Hans as a simple member of the team. I had also before that represented one of the US groups, COPRED, uh, at the UN as an NGO. And so we, uh, we send condolences to the family, but we also send a lot of love and appreciation to the history that Anita Wenden uh, produced. The current team uh, is made up of seven members, uh, not all obviously anywhere close to full time, but uh, in my role, I've also continued to uh, serve as coordinator of our UN team. But we have uh, most of the work being done by folks who are specialists in different areas. We have Alejandro Molina, who is focusing on decolonization work, and especially the Committee of 24, and the decolonization of still existing colonies with a special emphasis and focus and expertise on Puerto Rico. We have Seiko Odinga, who is a human rights specialist and whose focus of work is on genocide prevention and especially on the treatment of prisoners. Seiko is more than an expert on those topics. He himself, a US political prisoner, a Black Panther, who spent over three decades, torturous decades behind bars in the US. We have Dina Leco, who uh, hopefully you've already become acquainted with uh, because a plenary earlier this week in IPRA's special 20th biennial conference week uh, was put together by the Global Network of Women Peace Builders. And Dina serves as their director in many ways uh, of uh, their office in New York City at the UN. Uh, the Global Network of Women Peace Builders uh, was, of course, founded by one of IPRA's uh, leading lights over the decades, Dr. Betty Reardon, uh, and has Mavic Cabrera and many other extraordinary women leaders from around the world. Of course, one of the areas of their work is pushing that the Commission on the Status of Women become 
a truly uh, world-shaking commission uh, to create a real peace and justice for all people. We also have Cyril Obi, who you may be acquainted with because he was a presenter at our opening day uh, virtual plenary. Uh, we introduced him then, uh, as now, as a prominent leader of the Social Science Research Council. He also is uh, the director of the African Peace Builders Network and Next Generations. And of course, uh, Cyril therefore focuses much of our work on peacemaking and sustainable development, especially in Africa. I can't talk about the UN team without mentioning Emily Welty, who is not a current member of our team, but much beloved and never forgotten. Uh, when I got back into uh, some of this United Nations work, it was under Emily's leadership. She was the head of the team just before me. And uh, she didn't leave to become a secretary general. Rather, her plate, who uh, is already crowded by the fact that she chairs here in New York, the Pace University Peace Studies Department. But her plate also got filled when a certain organization that she was one of uh, 25 or 30 co-founders of, ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, uh, won a certain little thing called the Nobel Peace Prize. So as a co-Nobel laureate, and now as one of the chief UN representatives of the World Council of Churches, we always consider Emily a sister uh, member of our team, though unofficially. And so that leads me to Heidi Bogosian, who is uh, our current team member focusing on peace and disarmament work, and Francis Peterson, whose main work has been to be the, the bedrock of the youth leadership training aspect of our work. Uh, you'll hear from Heidi and Francis later in this broadcast, but uh, I'll just say that it was three or four years ago when uh, Francis, Emily, and I discussed an initiative uh, actually at her behest that said uh, the UN is great, but if we're not bringing our students, undergraduate and younger and older, uh, to the UN, if we're not engaging them in the international work in all of its facets uh, that we wish to do, then we're not really passing the work on and empowering people uh, for the next generation to build the kind of world we want to build. So we initiated a, a youth scholarship program, IPRA UN uh, Youth Scholarship Program. And it is uh, under the auspices of that program that this video and this conversation on youth leadership and training uh, continues. Uh, if you look at the program of the IPRA 20th Biennial Conference, which of course is happening both online and in Kenya, You'll note that throughout it, in different ways, there are streams of work around youth leadership. There is a special day, a uh, special part of the day uh, in Kenya devoted to uh, youth and student leadership training. There also has been at every conference of the last three conferences of our Latin American Peace Research Council pre-conference youth camps, youth peace camps, youth peace, youth, youth peace conferences, there's a tongue twister, and other spaces for our Latin American young people to have their leadership skills strengthened. And we've had emerging in North America, something called CONAP, uh, which is, uh, was to be a major Congress, uh, a major consortium for young uh, undergraduates to gather and connect internationally. The founding conference of CONAP was delayed because of COVID, but this video and our vision for the future is that we will have more and more youth leadership uh, integrated into every aspect of IPRA's work, uh, regionally, locally, and globally. So without further ado, uh, again, welcome to this uh, youth and youth mentors uh, profiling. And we're going to start 
by hearing a few words from Heidi Bogosian. Greetings from New York City. On the occasion of IPRA's 28th biennial conference, both online and in Kenya. I'm Heidi Bogosian from the AJ Musty Memorial Institute, an organization dedicated to supporting nonviolent activism on the grassroots level. Our board and our staff send their warmest wishes for a most productive five days. As you know, this moment in history presents a window of opportunity to remind the world of the transformative power and the effectiveness of nonviolent action. Over the past four years, the United States has exposed its darkest underside for all the world to see. Government leaders have emboldened human nature's worst tendencies, hate, intolerance, bigotry, violence, and disrespect for others. As people increasingly from all walks of life come together in the streets and online to resist these aberrant inclinations, we praise IPRA's research and visioning on the underpinnings of violence and your quest for creative solutions. And your agility now with technology is an example of the many different ways that we can bridge geographic barriers and work together to restore the balance of justice and equality worldwide. With that mission in hand, the A.J. Musty Institute sends its warmest wishes for an inspiring few days. And on a personal level, I am delighted to be a member of IPRA's United Nations team. As the granddaughter of Armenian genocide refugees, I'm heartened also to be a part of your community. Thank you. It's exciting to have almost like a family reunion, it is. Uh, a brief greeting from uh, the next uh, speaker. Although she never was a direct part of the IPRA United Nations team, she's been an IPRA leader for many years, as well as the leader of the uh, African Peace and Education Research Association. Uh, she's also had many significant roles in her native country, Burundi, and here in the United States. But the most recent one is a promotion to uh, an assistant vice president position uh, at Humboldt College in California. A great honor to have with us, Dr. Elavi Endura. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, my dear brother, Matt, for the, the nice introduction. It's very sad that I was unable to be in Nairobi, Kenya for the 28th biennial conference of the International Peace Research Association conference. It had been on my calendar for a very long time, but uh, the COVID-19 pandemic had its own plan. But still, um, I really, um, it's, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to connect with all participants at this wonderful IPRA 2021 conference, uh, to connect with those who are participating in person in Nairobi, Kenya, as well as those who are connecting and participating in the conference virtually from all corners of the globe. I am honored to extend my most heartfelt uh, greetings to each uh, and everyone and uh, my best wishes for a very successful IPRA 2021 conference. But just, you know, to add to my greetings, I have been reflecting and wondering what does a successful peace conference, research conference really mean uh, in this era, at this particular time uh, in the world. I hope and I wish that each and everyone will focus on really exploring and recommitting ourselves to peace research of consequence. But what does that really mean? 
it means uh, peace research uh, really the focuses on creating and uh, building capacities in all the communities that we represent at this magnificent conference, capacities to be inclusive, capacities to live together and work together to elevate our commitment to nonviolence and peace, starting within our families, in our local communities, in our places of employment, and within our broader circles of influence personally and professionally. Again, uh, I extend my warm greetings to everyone, and I hope we get to see each other again in person two years from now. Happy New Year 2021. Happy New Year, LV. I realized uh, I'm going to extend this a little bit um, just with a, a, a comment and, and a, a point maybe for you to respond to. Uh, I mentioned that uh, this piece, this greeting will be part of uh, uh, a, a part of the program that spotlights some of the IPRA United Nations work and mentoring. And I realized that uh, that there is another family figure we actually had hoped he would be able to hop on, yes. who um, who was a, a young student uh, not so long ago, at least in terms of my memory. In fact, you introduced him to me as I was about to race off and have a meeting uh, with Gene Sharp, mm -hmm. and we 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 pulled him along. So this young uh, person emerging into the field uh, uh, got to meet Gene. Uh, this young person uh, was also your baby brother and yeah. now holds a rather esteemed position within Burundian society. Could you, uh, could you just remind me of his title at this moment and where he's at? Well, the, the title of this uh, young uh, student and scholar who has become uh, a prominent uh, individual uh, with lots of consequential responsibilities in Burundi is Dr. Sixte Vigny Nimurava. He is upon graduating from George Mason University with a PhD in conflict analysis and resolution. He went straight back to Burundi where he had always believed he belonged in order to really uh, do the work uh, in his uh, home country and advance peace and nonviolence and, and build communities in Burundi. So he is currently serving as the president of the National Independent Commission uh, for Human Rights. He's extremely busy. Uh, his office is central to creating systems uh, that really reckon with the past uh, history of the country of Burundi, which is not a very easy history, uh, really advancing uh, reconciliation uh, in the country, truth and reconciliation, uh, including uh, going back to the graves of the millions, the thousands of people who uh, were killed uh, during the many uh, civil conflicts, uh, inter-ethnic conflicts uh, in Burundi. Uh, so he's very instrumental in the leading the efforts that Burundi has undertaken to recreate the history of Burundi by beginning with a reckoning with the truth and then uh, working together to reconcile because without reconciliation there won't be any future uh, for the country and the people of Burundi. In other words, uh, what they are really doing uh, is the work that he's leading is, is quite informative to us uh, here in the United States and in many other countries. Uh, we can't just cover up the past and urge people to get over it and move to the future, look ahead and go without paying attention to history 
to reckon with it as difficult as it may be. So truth telling, truth, truth seeking has to be at the core of the work we do uh, within the International Peace Research Association to actually build, nurture and sustain a beloved community. Amen. And, and you know, I'm reminded that uh, just as he was getting his PhD, uh, he had been back in Burundi already for some years. Yes. He came back to finish and defend his dissertation. And in that short time, uh, he came to New York uh, and came to the United Nations mm -hmm. for IPRA's first uh, main gathering of uh, young uh, peace scholarship awardees. Mm -hmm. uh, he went on a UN tour, special UN tour with us. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, along with uh, Dr. Emily Welty, mm -hmm. who was our former main representative and also uh, a Nobel Peace Laureate associated with the uh, international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. Uh, he and Emily were our two uh, key speakers to uh, what was then a, a group of undergraduate college students. So prominent families, uh, extended families, uh, communities building together for peace. Uh, Elevi, wonderful to have you with us and uh, extending uh, greetings for, for peace and justice uh, for Burundi, Thank you. Uh, for Uganda, where he's now uh, currently yes. doing election monitoring. Correct. All the peoples of Africa, all of the Americas, the whole world over. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> My name is Francis Peterson, and I want to speak to you for a moment on the young people who have made a difference in the world. Throughout history, so many young people have distinguished themselves as world changers. Anne Frank, for example, she was a Holocaust victim who wrote the diary of a young girl. While hiding from the Germans, she wrote her diary between the ages of 13 and 14. She died at the age of 16 in a concentration camp. Also, Helen Keller comes to mind. That she was the first deaf and blind person to earn a Bachelor's of Art degree. She was also an author and activist. She lost her hearing and sight at age 19 months. At age 20, she was admitted to Radcliffe College of Harvard University, where she graduated Phi Beta Kappa at age 24. And there is Dr. Martin Luther King. He was truly a world changer. He was only 26 years old at the start of his leadership in the civil rights movement, which he led from 1955 until he was assassinated in 1968. Marie Curie, a Polish-born physicist and chemist, she was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize at age 35 for physics, and she won it again when she was age 43 for chemistry. She is the only person to win the Nobel Prize in two scientific fields. Nelson Mandela, South African anti-apartheid leader. At age 25, he joined the African National Congress and worked with others to overthrow the system of apartheid. He spent 27 years in prison before becoming the president of South Africa. Malala, a Pakistani girl. She was attacked on a bus and shot in retaliation for her activism as a blogger for the education of women and children in Northwest Pakistan when she was 15 years old. She was the youngest ever Nobel Peace Prize winner when she won it at age 17. Bill Gates, he was 20 years old when he and his partner Steve Allen developed the microcomputer and software that became Microsoft. 
Steve Jobs, he and his partner created the Macintosh computer in 1976 when they were 21 years old. He went on to develop iPod, iPhone, and iPad. He was the co-founder and CEO of, of Apple. So far, the work of the IPRA UN Peace Scholars Program has been facilitated through mentors throughout predominantly North America. We'll hear from some of them and their work with young people now, starting with Michael Lodenthal, who is IPRA's cashier and chief bookkeeper in North America, and is also the executive director of the Peace and Justice Studies Association. Then we'll hear from Wendy Elizabeth Marshall of Pennsylvania, Ramsey Kanan of California, also with roots and connections and networks in Lebanon and the UK, from Ben Barson of Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and the Yaqui people of Mexico, and finally, Alicia Rodriguez of Puerto Rico. I'm going to attempt to share my screen right now. Um, so give me one second. Boop, boop, boop. Um, so you should be able to see that now. Today I can speak about the contributions that we have made to specifically educating and training next generation leaders. So one of the most inspiring projects that I'd like to talk about today is a work that I'm very centrally involved in known as the Prosecution Project, which has um, supported young scholars throughout the last 14 um, when the IPRA UN Fund was established. We were able to uh, support growing number of scholars originally in the Midwest, um, concentrated in Ohio, we now are supporting uh, 80 scholars, 80 young scholars uh, all across the world. We have people doing research in um, Korea, in Jamaica, in China, in Luxembourg, in the Netherlands, um, and throughout the United States. Uh, and what these young scholars have done is they're seeking to look at how the criminal justice system treats people uh, in various ways and how those ways in which people are treated relate to their um, age, race, ethnicity, religion, and other sorts of factors like that. Through the program, which we have called the Prosecution Project, we've been able to not only uh, train these 80 scholars, but also to provide them with outputs or outlets where they can feature their work. So we've had over 100, 100 uh, of these students publish um, blog posts, and 17 of these students appear in a forthcoming book, which uh, will be available for, for uh, purchase in about a month from now, the end of February, uh, put out by the series on political violence with Rutledge. And so just through this one example, I, I wanna again highlight the kind of two parts of it. One is that we've been able to, in how to do research, um, emerging scholarship, specifically, how the criminal justice system treats specifically political violence. Been, um, it's a little odd to say lucky enough, but we've been lucky enough to be in, an, in a period in which there have been huge surges of arrests um, dealing with political violence. So we, um, we widely quoted source in coverage throughout the summer as um, journalists tried to make sense of the George Floyd uprising. Um, we maintain still the largest publicly available data set on that, um, again, entirely produced um, by these young scholars. We have used that coverage to um, co-author or be featured in 17 uh, publications since, um, since so 17 in the past few months, as well as a radio interview and an Al Jazeera um, piece, which I appeared in. And Again, what I think is really is really notable with this is that we've been able to set up these systems in this COVID environment. A lot of people assumed that we would have to cancel programs like this when uh, when we were forced out of the classroom. So the image you can see behind is intended. We again have had we've been forced to decentralize, and so we have, like, as I said, people based all over the world doing this. So that's that's one example, and certainly the example that I that I know the best. But this work has been done it, to support grassroots projects throughout. 
So again, I'm kind of focusing on the academic one, but I also want to talk about a few others. Um, a lot of the, the, the people we've given support to um, are themselves organizers. And so I'm making a sense of false, uh, a false dichotomy maybe between activist and organizer, but a lot of the folks who, who we've been able to work with are, are organizers. Um, and, and in the way I understand it, you know, organizers produce other activists. This is similar to the training for trainers model. So beyond supporting individuals in the classroom, we've been able to train students who are then able to train other students in not only research methods, but also the wider application of those to the social justice framework. To be clear, although we're talking about research centric projects, these are all heavily grounded in both a social justice pedagogy and uh, I would say a justice centric goal. So yes, we are looking at the criminal justice system. Yes, we are looking at court documents. We're proceeding with what we like to call ideological neutrality, but we are 100% um, and very publicly in the service of justice. So we're looking at a whole range of ideological positions, but specifically looking at uh, how they relate to notions of justice. And so again, I'm, I'm focusing for a second on the prosecution project because it's something near and dear to my heart that has been uh, empowered by this, by the IPRA UN support. Um, but there's lots of other examples of, of the ways in which we've been able to support young scholars. So as it says here, between 2019 and 2020, we were able to give uh, scholarships to 40 students who participated in workshops. Uh, these, these were in a range of fields as is listed here. Um, some of these were in their own universities. Some of these were uh, places that they were traveled to and, and trained under. Uh, beyond that, we've been able to support projects themselves. Right, so that those projects can build their institutional capacity, those projects can bring in more young, uh, young people. And so those include book publishers, those include um, you know, non-governmental organizations, those include peace centers, those include a variety of different associations and organizations, which we hope will lead to the replication of this model um, in other areas. And so this is kind of focused on training people now who will become great leaders in the future future through practicing great leadership here, right? Giving them their first opportunities to publish, giving them their first opportunities to mentor other students, et cetera. The other kind of, the other stream in which I've been intimately involved in is looking at the kind of education and training within the university. So the examples that I had before, you know, some of those occurred in the classroom, but, 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 but increasingly so they are not, partially because the university system has um, you know, radically changed in the past, uh, in the past 10 months. So one of the things we've been able to do, which we're extremely proud of, is we were able to support um, students to attend a three-month-long engagement uh, organized by the Peace and Justice Studies Association. So in September, October, and November of 2020, so those are the, you know, in case you forget, those are the months leading up to the, the election, uh, the U.S. election, rather, we were able to um, support financially uh, 470 students who were able to attend this conference. Um, that was something we didn't think we could do originally. Uh, it's something that, that was uh, a, a great achievement for us. And we hosted, uh, and I don't have an exact number, we, we hosted dozens and dozens and dozens of uh, workshops, panels, discussions, and keynotes throughout those three months and brought in, you know, like I said, 470 students who were able to attend. Uh, you can see a screenshot, though there doesn't appear to be a lot of students in this particular screenshot. It was the one which had the most faces and cameras on. Um, the other thing we've been able to do is to provide scholarship funding to support student leaders, right? So students who, who are trying to do capacity building, students who are themselves building programs, we've been able to, um, to, to support about 150 of those scholars. And they were given individual grants to support their own their own um, scholarship. And so I, I wanna, in a sense, contrast and compare these two examples. The, the one before looking at research, which has sometimes occurred in the classroom, but which is aimed at advocacy. And, and these examples, which are more formal educational opportunities. And we've been able to support scholars at dozens of US uh, and Canadian universities, um, as well as one outside the United States and Canada. Um, and these, again, these have ranged from uh, programs on peace and justice studies to programs in psychology and sociology, anthropology, 
psychology, uh, I believe as a department of linguistics, uh, and there's two interdisciplinary programs as well. So our, 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 our logic in, in, in this is supporting people today who can one day increase the capacity of social movements for justice. And because, you know, the 18, 19, and 20 year olds that we're working with have a, a you know, an uncharted history, an uncharted future in, in the best sense, we hope that we can provide them with enough support and encouragement and stimulation while they're young to put them on the path of working in peace studies and working in justice studies. Because as anyone who, who works in this field knows, it is a very difficult field to manage um, a, a, a career in. And so we're hoping to, to be able to support people at this really crucial stage when they're deciding what they want to do uh, with their post-collegiate life. Um, and I think these both serve as, as very good examples of that. Hi, I am uh, Wendy Marshall. Um, I'm an adjunct at Temple University, a revolutionary. Um, and um, I guess what I have to say is, is more, more, a little more diffused than Michael, who's part of a formal program. Um, so I think that I've been a mentor in formal and informal ways in institutions and outside um, and have different um, experiences in those different kinds of places. But I think I start with the idea that I'm not gonna blow smoke up their asses um, and I'm gonna tell them what I know um, based on the fact, sort of from my vantage point uh, as an aging, disabled, queer, black, working class woman um, with a PhD um, in anthropology, a master's in, in, in religious studies, and 40 years in the struggle for justice. Um, and actually, that's really. Um, pointed for me right now, all of that, because the way that online pedagogy works is that it doesn't really matter whether there's a professor there or not, at least the way it works in gen ed courses at Temple. Um, courses are, um, are asynchronous um, and the professor is supposed to do a five minute mini lecture every week. Um, and I'm having a great deal of trouble with that pedagogically. Um, but basically, my relationship with young people, um, especially if we look at the institutional side, um, starts with teaching them things that they didn't really know before. Um, at, and I have experience doing this at elite schools and less elite schools. Um, for example, um, helping them understand the papal bull of 1493, the Doctrine of Discovery, which divides the world up um, into realms for colonization between Portugal and Spain, or talking about the roots of capitalism in um, the transportation, kidnapping and transportation of Africans, the theft of indigenous lands. Um, so I think part, partly I have a relationship with my students of um, telling them the truth um, in a way that doesn't privilege college education and I tell them all the time that college is stupid and I'm not sure why they're there, especially because they're going into debt to get it. Um, and for them to think critically about the world they live in and the place that they wanna have. So some of my students, JT Rohn, for example, Stephanie DeWolf, for example, have gone on to become um, activists and organizers, whether or not they pursued higher education. Um, I have other students who've, who've become um, union organizers and community organizers. Um, but one thing I wanna say about the role of a mentor, especially a, 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 a socialist mentor, a left mentor, is that I also have to be detached from outcomes. So, you know, I, I, I have firm ideas about what I think people should be doing, but I find that in mentoring, I have to let people figure out how they want to contribute and who they want to be. And I think that's important. So it's also sort of, um, you know, um, it's loose in the sense of people define their interests um, and figure out based on the things they're learning what they want to do with their, their lives. I feel like uh, mentoring is, um, is very underappreciated um, and is, uh, is a privilege really. I feel pretty strongly that I was not well mentored um, either as a young leftist um, or as um, you know, 
a student through all the through all the levels of my education. Um, and so partly I try to be the person I wish that I had um, when I was coming up, both in terms of um, sort of scholarly openness, truth, and commitment to the working class. Um, you know, yeah, I think that's that's a, a real thing. Um, so I don't really have too much more to say. Um, you talked about so that's it. Jessica Wolf and J.P. Okay. Rowan, and I'm wondering if you could just say some specific things that they did that impressed or inspired or continue to inspire you. Um, well, J.T., both of them were undergraduates of mine. At the University of Virginia, I taught um, one course called The Health of Black Folk um, and another course called White Supremacy. And I have and that's all a long time ago, but I'm still in touch with many, many of the people who took those courses, many of them are who are doing work um, in struggle. Um, so JT became my student, took Health of Black Folks and the White Supremacy. I helped with his, um, his senior thesis. And then he went to the Center for Thorough Organizing for training as an organizer, which I had gone to 25 years before him. Um, I was in the original class of 1986, and he was in 2000-something. Um, so, and then JT has um, gone on to um, get a PhD in history with a focus on um, gender studies and sexuality, but is also active politically. He is, for example, the co-chair of the Environmental Justice Committee of People Strike. Um, Stephanie DeWolf was also a student of mine, also took both those classes. Um, and has is currently in um, in Togo, which is um, where her mother is from, um, and um, has done a lot of work um, with urban gardening and nutrition um, in New Orleans. And both of them, they're 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 just a few of the examples because I have I have a lot more. But both of them inspire me every day um, and help me to um, understand the importance of mentoring. And just one more thing, I didn't think I got around to saying this, is that it's the intergenerational thing, which I think is also really important because I'm very conscious with my young people, my students and other young people that I'm transmitting shit because I lived during the civil rights movement and they didn't. I lived during the black power movement and they did it. I remember life before Reagan, all that. So partly it's, a, it's about this sort of cultural transmission of history and values. Um, that help us to prepare the future generations for the gigantic shit show that life on this earth is shaping up to be past. All right, I have managed to unmute myself. All right, my name is Ramsey Kanan. Uh, my family are Lebanese, which is why I have a funny name. And uh, from the age of five, I grew up in Scotland, which is why I have a funny voice. Um, but uh, from the age of 13, uh, also from my bedroom in my mother's house in Scotland, I've been involved in the publishing and distribution of, of radical ideas. Um, I was able to do so because I was mentored by a bunch of unsurprisingly people that were considerably older than I was into the ways of uh, the dissemination of ideas. But it means that for the last 40 years, I've been wrestling with the twin problems of, of how do we actually, uh, if we think that ideas do matter, how do we disseminate them out into the world? And secondly, if many of those ideas are uh, currently uh, minority ideas, shall we say, in terms of the general population, how do we keep those ideas alive as well as transmit them to, to uh, the current and future generations? Uh, so I've been involved in a variety of publishing and distribution projects. Um, currently, uh, I'm the publisher of PM Press, and we do about 40 books a year. Uh, as part of our efforts, we are continually involved with a, a, a rotating cast of, of uh, folks who are helping us in an unpaid capacity, shall we say, formally. Um, to, to get those ideas out into the world. Uh, I'll just mention 
two folks very briefly. Uh, much of what we do uh, since for the last 40 years, the book trade in all its various manifestations has been in a state of, of virtual collapse, uh, which has only been precipitated further with the current pandemic. But one of the main things we've done to, is to try and how do we get books out in the non-traditional way? So how do we disseminate ideas that's not through the academy, that's not through libraries and is not through bookstores? Um, so much of those efforts have been uh, through tabling at events. Those events varied from anywhere from academic conferences to political gatherings, events, uh, marches. You know, I got my pussy hat here at the first women's march in Oakland, whenever that was, four or five years ago, um, where we were also doing a table. And much of our tabling, we rely on, on um, folks outside of PM to do much of that work. And in doing that work, we are helping them to not only get immersed in those ideas, but also so they can figure out ways of how they can actually themselves disseminate those ideas and get them out into the world. Um, so to give two examples, uh, a comrade of mine had a, a teenage son who about the age of 14 or 15, he came to me and said, look, you know, I think it'd be useful for Malcolm to, to figure out how the world works. So I'd like you to employ him, you know, pay him some nominal wage, but to actually help you tabling. So we did this. And uh, Malcolm, being a fine young mind, took to it very well. And uh, so started out helping us, uh, I believe it was actually at Left Forum, which some of you might be familiar with, big kind of lefty uh, gathering, and really kind of took those ideas and ran with them to the extent that um, when local events were happening in New York, Mark was saying, hey, I'd love to, uh, you know, take some books to this. Um, how can I do so? How does it work? You know, can I get my own square reader so I can start taking money? So he became uh, a much more proactive participant in that concept of, of, uh, of getting ideas out there. And I believe um, Matt may have met him doing, doing an event with, uh, with Oscar. Uh, when uh, Oscar was released at one, released uh, one of his uh, launch events where uh, Malcolm was doing the books. Another person that came to us again saying I want to volunteer was a woman called Natalie. Um, she first came and helped us actually do inventory at our warehouse in Oakland because uh, she was on holiday there during inventory time and thought this would be a good idea. Again over the years she has taken a very, very active interest in the dissemination of ideas and her desire to, to forge a path for herself in the world of ideas and in the book trade in particular. So when she moved to Montreal, she took it upon herself. She asked us for contacts of not only of, for our own books, but other people who locally might have books that she could distribute. She um, started taking them to the kind of punk rock shows. She was involved in the punk rock community, started doing tabling at various punk rock events. She then went to intern at a bookstore and became the events organizer and ended up uh, just a couple of years ago getting a job at uh, one of the big New York publishing houses and where I'm delighted to say she uh, works as an editor. But she was one of the people involved in um, the which some of you may have heard of of the current attempts of people within the mainstream publishing industry of trying to inject some social justice and democracy within the industry so she was one of the people that was pushing for to have more uh in the wake of the ferguson up uh, not the ferguson the the george floyd uprisings to get more people involved more people of color involved in the in the formal book trade, um, instigated discussions around the uprisings, 
and uh, says really kind of continues to, to, to push the envelope in, in her work. Um, and we continue to do work with her. And while her, her formal work is now uh, as a children's books editor, um, she's working with us on editing various uh, adult books. So I think these are just two examples of the ways that we've been able to pass the torch to various of the of the uh, younger generation, which has been a bit astonishing, actually. And just for those who don't uh, necessarily know from your own knowledge of PM Press uh, and some of this work, the Oscar that uh, Ramsey was talking about uh, in terms of uh, Malcolm's work, and when I think I did meet Malcolm, is uh, the Puerto Rican, uh, now internationally renowned uh, patriot, Oscar Lopez Rivera, and PM published uh, his book. And of course, uh, as you've heard already, um, uh, much of the work that this IPRA um, special youth leadership training piece uh, uh, from the UN work we do has emerged. Uh, looks at international affairs. And of course, Oscar has been one of the people we followed most consistently uh, who has testified uh, in front of the UN Decolonization Committee and before testifying was a subject of the UN Decolonization Committee. So Malcolm's um, growth in all of that uh, grew also directly out of some of that uh, UN work with Oscar Lopez Rivera. Uh, also stay tuned because uh, a little bit later in the show, you'll be hearing from one of Oscar's co-defendants, Alicia Rodriguez, who is also part of this circle. Ben, it's all yours. Um, my name is Ben Barson. I'm a teaching artist and a scholar, composer, performer, a revolutionary organizer. I've worked on the campaign to free Russell Maroon Schultz, a political prisoner, uh, part of the Black Liberation Army in Philadelphia in the 1970s. I've been working on that campaign since uh, 19, uh, sorry, since 2011. Um, but I also am a uh, mentor and um, and saxophone instructor who tries to work with uh, students who want to express um, their revolutionary politics and art and also want to use their art to develop a political practice. Um, part of my work involves a group called the Afroyaki Music Collective. Uh, which includes my partner, Hizel Zanath Rodriguez, who is a descendant of the Yaqui uh, Nation, who are an indigenous group in Sonora, Mexico, uh, who have resisted colonialism um, for 500 years and actually were never colonized by the Spanish. They're currently in a life and death struggle for their uh, water rights. Um, they, they have been the historic guardians of a, of a river that's been compared to the Nile for its importance to the ecosystem in Sonora. Um, I have been uh, very uh, blessed and uh, appreciative of the support I've received from the IPRA UN Initiative uh, grant. And I have used um, this support and this guidance to uh, continue our work in uh, mentoring a new generation of artists activists. Uh, specifically, I was able to work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison as part of a residency program uh, which we called artivism and uh, decolonizing performance and intercultural solidarity. And I'm going to show some videos that I prepared that were highlights of that residency, which took place between January and May of 2020 and was impacted by COVID-19, but we managed to nonetheless create a multimedia piece, which we'll be showing you some experts, excerpts of right now. Um, so I'll be sharing my screen here. And uh, please let me know if um, the audio is coming through okay. Okay, so I'll be These young artists full of energy who are unafraid to go the extra step to relate to activists all over the world because that's what we need for transformation right now. <laughs> 
I like to collaborate with other artists. And so this was one of the best opportunities for my freshman year. The students were quite diverse in that they came from different academic backgrounds. Engineers, poets, dancers, lots of musicians, designers signed up. Their spirit and their ideas were really innovative and they were invested in the project. I think it was a learning experience for us as much as for them. I was inspired by each and every one of them. There should be more classes that are like this because it just felt like a really positive community and like we were always trying to brainstorm and bring new ideas into the table. I'm going to be showing a few clips in a row. So Matt, maybe you can edit out these transitionary moments or I can just send it to you as a single video. Mario Luna and Anai Ochoa from the Yaki community. Yeah, we spend so much time researching the Yaki people and the struggle, but something is different when you're in the room with these people and they're telling you, this is my life, this is my fight. Tuvimos que salir y conocer otras luchas para poder conocer el poder de la música, el poder comunicativo de la danza, el enorme poder de una pintura y el alcance que tiene un documental. As a team, everyone that shares their experience allows us to enter their world, which allows us to be able to expand in the way that we approach things. When the university closed down because of the COVID pandemic, it was quite a seamless transition. Improvising, music kind of helps you improvise in life. <laughs> when it came time for us to jump on an online virtual world, we, we were able to do it. What the students are learning is not how to stage and produce a show, it's how to record and mix and conceptualize an album or a, a multimedia online presentation as a musician. And that's been really important for me to develop my work and for Giselle to develop her work. Composition of revolution equals a rampage. Buffering solution is time for new things. And so met Mama C, who was a Black Panther who moved to Tanzania. Can you hear me? Can you see me? I can hear you and I can see you. This is my first time. She was going to actually fly here from Tanzania. Unfortunately, because of the virus, everything was stopped, but she was part of the class as well. She plays a lot of different traditional harps from East and West Africa. Good thing I kept it. <laughs> she gave a very inspirational and loving conversation to our students over Zoom, and she will be recording with us on the final project. We're all here for a reason. We're all doctors. We're all healers. You know, and we heal through our art and through our words. And uh, now I'm just going to show an excerpt of the piece that we came up with in abstentia, physical abstentia, but very much in communication. Um, this, um, all the people you'll see here are dancing. Um, they videotaped themselves dancing. Um, this was uh, during the period of the George Floyd uprisings, and this piece is called Police Chase, and it was written by one of our students, Maggie Cousin, um, with contributions from uh, Mama C, who you just heard from, and also a hip-hop artist named Nejma Nefertiti. Penalty, full-blown weaponry, supremacy, no peace penitentiary, recklessly, this 
off and half in it for centuries. Try to take us out, erase all our memories, accuse me of accessories. That's the recipe, plant drugs on me while aiming at my senses. Telling everybody they shot her accidentally. She didn't have a gun on her, coincidentally. She didn't have a gun on her, coincidentally. She didn't have a gun on her, coincidentally. I hear those sirens. Makes my heart beat too fast. My heart beat too fast, y'all. Oh, sing for Makes me, makes me wanna scream. Make me, make, make me wanna holler. Make me holler. Freedom, freedom. So um, just want to emphasize that um, many of our students have never done anything like this. Uh, they've never had the opportunity. Many of them have not had the opportunity to create politically charged um, art before and certainly not in a university setting. Um, a lot of times, uh, especially in sort of music departments and jazz programs, uh, tends to skew somewhat conservatively in terms of thinking about uh, the discipline and not focusing on um, connections to social movements, which is ironic considering um, that jazz and hip hop and black music have been expressions, revolutionary expressions of uh, the African descended peoples in this country. Um, so we um, theorized that, we discussed that, we um, collaborated with artists internationally and locally, as you saw. Um, this piece was um, called Contested Homes, and we also showed um, portions of it at a teach-in on Russell Maroon Schultz on December 11th of um, last year, and also at the book launch of uh, Black Power Afterlives, The Enduring Significance of the Black Panther Party, uh, a volume uh, released by Haymarket Books uh, uh, in October. And we also, um, our students continue to um, be in touch with us. Uh, many of them are active in the Line 3 protests. Um, Line 3 is a destructive tar sands pipeline owned by the Canadian multinational Enbridge that is being pushed through indigenous lands from Alberta to Superior, Wisconsin, and this resistance is indigenous led. Um, so anyway, our students have continued many, especially one in particular named Eric Franz is um, very active in the line three um, activism. So uh, once again, just, you know, we're really happy to be here as part of this panel and um, thank you so much for your support. Thanks, Matt, for giving me this opportunity. Okay, just um, share some words. Um, first of all, my name is Alicia Rodriguez, a former Puerto Rican political prisoner um, who did close to 20 some years in a state and federal prison. And um, the reason that I've been invited, you know what I mean, to share my story is because since 2013, I've been a pottery teacher here in the town of Calle, Puerto Rico. Um, where did I learn pottery? I learned pottery in prison. So um, I think it's important to highlight, you know, that um, whatever I picked up, you know, behind prison bars is something that I do inject in my class and with the um, pottery program. Um, pottery to me, you know, was a very important medium um, in prison, which is definitely a, a hostile and dehumanizing um, environment. So it was a gift 
you know, to be able to work with clay. Uh, why? Because um, first of all, it's tactile and it's one of the only mediums, you know what I mean, that offers the ability that if things do not go well with your project, you can rehydrate and start again. Um, that is a, a unique quality because um, in, in the act of uh, pottery making, one of the things that I became aware of is that you have to concentrate, okay? You're, you're moving your hands and, and you're in the act of creating things, something, and all your attention is drawn to what is in um, what you're doing with your hands and the clay. I found out that it was, um, the clay is like an antidepressant, I mean, a natural form of antidepressant. Um, it released stress. Um, it gave me the ability to start a project finishing it. So in, in a certain way, it um, elevates, you know, your self-esteem. So um, it, um, it helped, you know what I mean, to work, you know, within that environment, you know what I mean, that was, as I said before, very dehumanizing. It helped for me to go within myself and um, begin to feel joy, begin to feel that no matter what was on the outside of, of in your environment, there was a, an ability you know what I mean, to be one with the clay and all your energy went into that clay. So um, since I came out, you know, the latter part of 1990 and it wasn't until 2013 that I was given an opportunity to begin teaching pottery. Um, I started off, you know, with a, a, a small group, you know I mean, in a plain, you know, classroom environment, it wasn't, you know, conducive to a, a pottery studio but um, I think it went hand in hand that when you want to do something, you know what I mean, you know, start it. And the beauty of it was that I didn't do it alone. It was a collective effort. It was, you know, a, a, a union of myself with my students. And as we started working, you know what I mean, um, originally with hand building techniques and later with, with pottery wheel, there was um, was almost organically, you know, what I mean that we started to form a a, a a pottery community. And why do I say that? Because in that classroom environment, you know, what I mean, yes, I was the one that was imparting, you know, what I mean, my experience and teaching teaching technique, but it was at a very horizontal level. And it gave the students the opportunity, you know, I mean, to come in with their unique experiences about dealing with challenge and merging it and, and, and helping. It was a constant, you know, flow back and forth between myself as a teacher and seeing how the students themselves began to find, you know, their voice. Um, and create beautiful pieces. And they created beautiful pieces because they had, you know, a safe environment, you know what I mean, to explore. They had a safe um, environment to experiment. Okay, if it didn't work out, they would note it in their, in their you know, um, in their notebooks and we would discuss it and then they would, you know, approach it in, a, in a, a different manner. And I think that was very good for, for, you know, developing, you know, a way of solving, problem solving. They didn't have to do it alone. You know, uh, we, get, we give each other constant feedback. So in, in that kind of an environment, um, I, I began to see how, you know, students from very basic, you know, projects, began to develop, you know, skills via confidence to just, you know, implement, you know, an, another uh, dimension, you know, to their, to their clay pieces. So 
it was beautiful to see that, you know, and, and nowadays, you know, I mean, um, th this, you know, pottery is for me, you know what I mean, an ability today to slow down because life is so hectic, hustle and bustle. Life is, you know, I got to do this, I got to do that, I don't have this, I don't have that. But when you're in, you know what I mean, in the, the, that space of creating, you know what I mean, you can push those, those negative, you know, emotions to the side for the moment and kind of like regroup and um, regenerate because that what is what art does. You know what I mean? And especially in the field of clay. Because clay, you know what I mean, it 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 it, it comes to be, you know what I mean, after and what is it? It's it's like a, a it's sediment, sedimentation, you know what I mean? But for it to become those particles, it took millions of years, you know what I mean, of both geological and environmental transformation. And the students become aware of that. Students become aware, you know what I mean, of the origin of clay, you know what I mean, and that it is malleable and that it has existed, you know, for, for millions of years. And just knowing that, you know what I mean, brings us to, to even today, you know what I mean, where technology, you know, kind of like separates one from 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 each other from family from community and whatnot but the clay is is like a metaphor that we do belong you know what i mean we we do belong we do have you know uh a a, a connection you know what i mean and we're part of and those are words that i'm 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 throwing out there you know what i mean and it's it's in here but the potter begins to move and create from a different source, a different source. You know, sometimes you have to put that intellectual, analytical, you know, type of rationale, shut that down and, th and then move into another realm, which is your intuition. You know what I mean? So it is powerful. And, and once again, you know, the, the whole, um, the history behind this is I come out of, I'm in prison, I, I, I learn these skills, you know what I mean, and I come out, I continue working, you know what I mean, on my own, but then 2013, there is that, um, you know, uh, opportunity for me to be a teacher within a fine arts, you know, municipality school. For the first time, you know, I mean, in their existence to teach clay. And um, that was in 2013. But 2017, um, all hell breaks loose um, because a month before Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria that devastated this island, you know, with the Category 5 um, hurricane, something else hit us. Okay, something else hit us, and that was the fiscal control board, you know what I mean, that was imposed by, you know, the Obama administration, and that was basically, you know what I mean, to begin implementing austerity measures. So how did that somehow or other tie in with our school in Kaje? Well, a month before the hurricanes, um, in the month of August, you know, the director calls the teachers of the, school, of, of the school and, you know, with tears in her eyes, she begins to say, um, we do not have the funds to open up the school year. That meant all of us <laughs> were without a job. And um, it was there, you know what I mean? that the concept of Taje Kwaguare is birthed. And Taje Kwaguare is a fiscally sponsored project 
with the goal, with the goal of, you know what I mean, becoming independent, you know, thanks to the donations, you know, that, that, that come in, is to continue being autonomous. Many of us, you know, go to museums, and there's the, um, the, the section of pottery done in the Egyptian times, done, you know, during, you know, different um, moments, you know, the beautiful, beautiful pottery work of the Asians, you know what I mean? The beautiful pottery in, in, in those different parts of the world. But there was this, there's an importance of coming back home, you know what I mean? And because our, ancestors left a legacy, our Tainos and pre-Tainos, pre pre-Tainos left us a legacy. So, um, you know, Tajet Kwaguare wants to, you know, rescue that. We want to rescue that. And, and um, the, the beauty of it is, you know, in 2017 comes the birth of Tajet Kwaguare and that was because of the Fiscal Control Board. And uh, last year, you know, Puerto Rico was hit with, an, with a horrific earthquake, the beginning of 2020, school shut down. Shortly after that came the COVID pandemic. We were no longer able to go into, once we, once we came back into the classroom, like in the um, later part of February, we had a shutdown because of COVID. So, so Tajet Guaguare is specifically for these, you know, catastrophes. You know what I mean? For these moments where the, where we cannot give classes in in you know the school, um, and it's a breath of fresh air for my students. It's a breath of fresh air to say, okay, we're not in our classroom. Um, and now what are we going to do? You know, Tajay Guaguare provides the material and it provides me with a stipend to come on board, you know what I mean? And learn how to do clay in the time of COVID, which was through Zoom. You know what I mean? I'm, I never worked with Zoom before. Some of my students didn't do that either. You know what I mean? It was a learning experience for all of us to come out of our comfort zone and just like the clay challenges, you know what I mean? It makes you think outside of the box. Struggles at our are at multiple levels, multiple levels. Um, and I think in 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 this situation, Bajet Guaguare begins to move within the community. And when I say community, you know what I mean? The students that come in, you know, are, are mothers or their sons or their daughters, you know what I mean? And I, I try a lot to incorporate, you know, not just those that come in, but the community also. So, so it's moving in that elementary level, which is, you know, la comunidad, my community as opposed to going outside of my community, which is just as important, and there's work being done at that level. But I, I, I touch home base, you know, I touch home base and I see, you know what I mean? I, I see how that transcends. So, you know, Matt, you know, thank you, thank you for giving me this opportunity, you know what I mean, to, to share, you know, what's happening at this, side of the world in our island of Puerto Rico in the town of Calle. One can see from this small selection of IPRA's eclectic mentor professors and United Nations representatives that one of IPRA's latest initiatives, our UN Youth Leadership Scholarship Program, is extremely diverse not just in terms of geography or race and ethnicity, genders or nationalities, but also diverse in terms of ideologies and methodologies, emphasis, approaches and orientations, 
strategies, and tactics. One great example is thinking about maroons and maroonage. You heard from one of our mentors about the struggle to free U.S. Black Liberation political prisoner Russell Maroon Schultz and the other U.S. political prisoners. And while we've brought these cases and will bring these cases to the U.N. and international levels in the spirit of Mandela, we also understand that we meet at the U.N. with some very interesting peoples. At the same time, for example, we've connected with the Maroon societies throughout the Caribbean and South America, who are themselves beginning to demand both recognition and sovereignty, from grassroots initiatives to working directly with governments and nation states. You'll see me in this picture with the Trinidadian and Tobago permanent representative to the United Nations, Penelope Althea Beckles, who is one of those championing the struggle of Maroons at the UN. We therefore invite you to think with us about how we can be more diverse, more eclectic, more universal, and more effective in working for a peace with justice. To close us out, we'll hear some words of inspiration from our elder, who will have the last word, Dr. Francis Peterson. Thank you. As a member of the older generation, I would like to offer some words of encouragement to the next generation. I read an article published by the Institute for Public Policy Research in 2017 by Craig Thorley and Will Cook, which left me quite disturbed. Some of the findings were that the younger workers today are more likely to be in part-time work. The younger workers today are more likely to be in jobs for which they're overqualified. Younger workers today are more likely to be underemployed. Young people today are increasingly likely to report experiencing mental health problems. Younger workers are more likely to report poor mental health compared to older workers. Jobs insecurity and low pay are associated with poor mental health among younger workers. I really, really want to, to talk to you a bit about encouragement. We all need encouragement like never before. Webster Dictionary defines encouragement as follows, to give support, to inspire. Here are a few of the resources I discovered as a youth leader that provided so much encouragement to me and have continued to do so over the years. First, a poem titled, Hold On by Colin McCarthy. When the day isn't going the way that it should, when there are too many clouds in your sky, when the path you walk along takes a turn for the worse, hold on. When something you're working on doesn't work out, when it seems there are less smiles than frowns, and just when things seem like they're about to fall apart, hold on. It's okay to get discouraged, but don't ever give up. The sun is always up there somewhere, shining in the sky. Reach out and do your best to chase the clouds away. And remember that every tomorrow is a whole new opportunity to begin a new in the light of a brand new day. Just hold on and good things will surely come your way. Nelson 
Mandela said, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. Abraham Lincoln had many setbacks on his way to his greatest triumph. 1831, he lost his job, setback. 1832, he was defeated in his run for Illinois State Legislature, setback. 1833, he failed in business, another setback. But he was elected to Illinois State Legislature. Ah, that was a success. But in 1835, his sweetheart died. Set back. Set back. He had a, in 1838, Abraham Lincoln was defeated in his run for Illinois House Speaker. Another setback. 1843, he was defeated in his run for nomination for U.S. Congress. Setback. 1846, he was elected to Congress. A success. 1848, he lost the renomination. Setback. 1849, he was rejected for land officer position. Another setback. In 1854, he was defeated in his run for U.S. Senate. Setback. 1856, he was defeated in his run for nomination for vice president. Another setback. 1858, he was again defeated in his run for U.S. Senate. 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected president of the United States of America. In my closing remarks, I like to say that Abraham Lincoln's life journey is a powerful illustration of a biblical principle that says the race is not to the swift or to the strong, but to those that endures to the end. I pray that you will not let fear, anxiety, and discouragement overwhelm you because of the coronavirus pandemic. Reach out for help. Reach out for help. It is said that in today's technological age, that we are more connected and yet more lonely than ever before. The former U.S. Surgeon General, Vinnick Murphy, stated, the most common ailment I saw as a doctor was not heart disease or diabetes. It was loneliness. In my closing, my challenge to you is to be encouraged, hold on, and do not quit. Thank you.